screen. If you hold on one sec, Peter, and then I'll just uh, oh, okay. start yeah. off. And, uh, 9.30 for, uh, so of course, yeah, 9.30. It was 10.30 just before Easter, uh, when you moved ahead and we didn't move on to summertime. Anyhow, welcome everybody. Welcome back after our short Easter break to our 48th Wedding Online Sport Economics Seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Peter Grew, who's presenting. Uh, and uh, I don't actually have your title to hand, Peter, so here's probably a good point for you to helpfully share your screen so I can see your title uh, and um, uh, can uh, take it from there. But um, as we as we usually do, in fact, I've got the title now, The anti fluty Effect, the Impact of Athletic Malfeasance on the University. Uh, Peter's got about an hour and a half in which to speak. Uh, and um, he's got uh, both of his co-authors here on the call uh, who uh, are able to view the chat uh, and can therefore answer questions that folk may have based on Peter's talk. It's joint work with Abigail Kumye uh, and Kurt Rothoff, both, as said, are on the call. Uh, without any further ado, I will hand over to Peter to take away his talk. All yours, Peter. Okay. Hey, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, let me present our research. I have to admit, during COVID, this has kind of become something I look forward to on a Friday. Uh, even so, so much so that I uh, Google mapped reading to see what it looked like, and it looks like it's a town I want to visit sometime <laughs> in uh, the future. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll invite you over, Peter, for a conference. Okay, thanks. We can. Yeah, I was, I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the title of our paper, this research, is The Anti-Flutie Effect, the Impact of Athletic Malfeasance on the University. And I realize the title itself needs some unpacking. Uh, what exactly is the Flutie Effect? Wh why do we think that we might see the opposite of the Flutie Effect? And what exactly has athletic malfeasance have to do with the university at all? Uh, and uh, this is um, co-authored work. Uh, two people at App State University, Austin Eggers and myself, uh, and at um, Seton Hall, Abigail Cormier, Cormier and Kurt Rudoff. Uh, Abigail is actually going this fall to start her PhD program at the University of Georgia. Uh, so I figure one of the best places to start to unpack what I mean by the anti fluty effect is with a metaphor. And Austin had found this um, Quote by uh, Scott Barnes, athletics truly is the front porch of the university. It's not the most, uh, I can't read it, <laughs> in the house, uh, but the most visible, it comes with it opportunities and responsibilities. And I think that's a good way to kind of frame this. Athletics and universities are connected. Uh, athletics are the most visual part. And I know that, uh, the American sports system is unique, so I want to spend some time um, unpacking this. And I, I decided to go back to where it all began. Sports and universities in the United States have a long history. Uh, I grew up in Michigan, and I remember listening to Michigan football on the radio as a child. And I discovered just recently that Michigan and Minnesota had been playing football uh, since 1892, and they have a trophy that goes back and forth to the winter that's become known as the Little Brown Jug. So there's a long history of that connection. Uh, and then the first NCAA co coll collegiate men's basketball tournament took place in 1939. And that tournament has grown to the point which has now become known as March Madness. And every March, it's considered one of the big sporting events that people watch. And so there's this connection to sports that's just there. And if you grow up in America, you just know that college sports is what people watch. Um, but the surprising thing in the United States is that this interest doesn't stop at the university. It's not like I go to a school. It's There's uh, both statewide and nationwide interest. I did my PhD at the University of Kentucky, and the first thing I noticed when I got to Kentucky was everywhere I looked, people were wearing bleep blue t-shirts. Uh, and actually, they even nicknamed it the Big Blue Nation. Uh, Kentucky is kind of a unique state because there is no professional sports team. 
And I, I realize now I say UK Big Blue Nations. I'm not talking about United Kingdom. I'm talking about University of Kentucky. Um, and because of that, not just, like I said, not just um, the fans come not just from the university, but they come from everywhere. Uh, Klotfelder had an interesting article that really reinforced this. And uh, he looked at obituaries and he discovered there are diehard fans out there. And the surprising thing of these diehard fans, about 30% of them are not alumni of the universities. And I just picked the shortest quote. She enjoyed family traditions, knitting and Penn State football. Uh, so because of this interest, the thing that has really grown is now college sports is a big business. It is huge. We have a multi million dollar entertainment business connected to a college. And I just listed some of the facts. Uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament that started in 1939 now generates about 1.05 billion in 2019. Uh, of course, it was canceled in 2020, but it returned in 2021. Uh, if we look at revenues, we find that the top athletic revenue school is the University of Te Texas, and they make 224 million. Uh, and that's once again, 28 and 2019 data. Um, uh, there's also, since TV has now created networks for the different conferences, and there's something known as a Southeastern Conference, which the University of Kentucky is in, Alabama, it's all in the Southeastern United States. And the network has uh, 721 million in revenues in 2019, which turns out to be 45 million per school. So the top three numbers really point out that there's a lot of revenues that come into the school. However, there's a lot also paid out at schools. So the revenue comes in and the top paid football coach, Nick Saban, Alabama, makes $9.3 million a year. Uh, top paid basketball coach, John Calipari at the University of Kentucky, the Big Blue Nation, $8.1 million a year. And also a lot is spent on single-use sports stadiums, uh, and Texas A&M has the most expensive at $450 million. So there's a lot of revenue that comes in uh, and a lot of revenue costs that go out. Uh, the, but the big surprising result is in this multi-billion dollar sports entertainment business, because it's connected to the college, this, the athletes are not employees they're amateurs. They're students first, athletes second. Uh, and the people who run it is the NCAA National Collegiate uh, Athletic Association. And I pulled this directly off their website. Uh, a player must have amateur status. They lose their amateur status if the, the following conditions are met. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of uh, chinks, I guess you'd say, in this um, amateur status belief. Uh, if you watch the N NCAA uh, March Madness, you'll notice that some of the players wore uh, hashtag not NCAA property on their t-shirts. Uh, athletes are realizing that they generate a lot of money for the university, but they can't even license their own likeness. Uh, there's actually a court case right now uh, at the um, Supreme Court, the National Collegiate Athletic Association versus Alton that is looking into uh, whether indeed there's antitrust violations going on with the NCAA as a cartel. Um, now, in terms of our research, this background provides two consequences that are important. Uh, Multi-million dollar sports entertainment business are tied to the universities, whether we like it or not. And one of the surprising results is the majority of colleges subsidize athletics, not the other way around. You would think with all this revenue coming in that uh, it would be a cash cow for the university. I'd get all this money and then I'd spend it on the econ department. I'd spend it on arts. I'd spend it on other things. But really, it's not the case. There are a few schools that do generate more revenues than that. But the majority of colleges uh, subsidize athletics through student fees and other ways. Uh, and the other thing is colleges 
are not just higher education. They provide multiple amenities that might draw students to the university. And second, in terms of our research, amateurism might lead to potential malfeasance. Uh, if we view a star athlete as an employee, um, we realize as sports economists that if this was professional, we would be playing these athletes quite a bit. And we see that every time players move from uh, college ranks to the professionals, we see that they make a whole lot of money. And so they're generating the same amount of money, it, it, well, types of money at, at the um, college level, but they're not paid. So stars have high marginal revenue products, but the amateur status keeps them from being paid, which leads to potential illegal payments under the table. Uh, also, star athletes have to allocate their time. Uh, they're supposed to be students first, athletes second, and so I might lead to malfeasance where I don't actually, um, I have a paper class <laughs> where I don't necessarily go to class and I have some other sort of academic cheating. So there's different kinds of academic cheating that might take place. Uh, let me take a closer look at these first two consequences, um, the multi-dollar uh, industry and why co colleges are sometimes subsidizing athletics. Uh, in an interesting article, Sanderson and Sigurd, 2017, titled NCAA as a Cartel, Why Does It Exist? asked the following question. How have over 100 of the 128 athletic departments persuaded the universities, presidents, and trustees to continue debating, to devoting scarce general funds to collegiate sports? Whenever they incur financial losses, they seem to double down, spend even more on salaries for coaches, improving physical facilities, rather than viewing these losses as a signal to deploy assets elsewhere. And then a little further in the article, they said, why might colleges do this? And they answered it with these three questions. First, intercollegiate athletics might attract greater appropriations from states. So the, the, the saying here is, oh, I have a good football team or a good basketball team. Uh, the state might say, yeah, I'm going to give more states funds for it. Second, I have a successful sports team and it might increase fan in interest, that fan interest being alumni, and they increase private donation. And third, high pro profile sports programs like other campus amenities may attract additional enrollment to the university. And that leads us to the title of the article. The Flutie effect. Uh, the Flutie effect uh, comes about by what happened in the 1984 Boston football game. Uh, Doug Flutie, the quarterback of Boston College, threw a last second pass, which has become known as a Hail Mary against the University of Miami, and they won this unexpected victory. So in the two years following that win, Boston College increased uh, applications by 30 percent. Um, now, going to App State, I can't help but point out that the same thing happened to us. In 2007, Appalachian State blocked a field goal in the final seconds of a game against the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan is a big, uh, I think it was ranked five in the nation at the time. We were a small school. We were considered a cupcake, an easy win at the beginning of the season. We won. We had our own fluidity effect. Matter of fact, our little t school made the cover of the Sports, Illustrate, uh, Sports Illustrated, and we saw an increase in application 15% after uh, the upset. So why do we see this connection between sports? What exactly about these Flutie effects is taking place? And so I'm going to uh, give another an example of a useful metaphor, uh, and that's the college as a country club. I came across this article in the Journal of um, uh, Labor Economics, and I th thought it was a good way to think about why athletics as a front porch is such so important. And it says students place a value on consumption amenities such as ac extracurricular activities, sports fraternities, dormitories, and including athletics. Uh, Jacobs et al. suggests that universities are like a country club. 
and not only provide academic services, but also consumption amenities. Uh, the, like I said, the surprising result is they found that for every dollar spent on academics, the university spends 45 to 80 cents on other consumption amenities to draw students to the, to the university. And so that might explain that uh, spending on athletics by the university. Um, and if we look at the Flutie effects, what we find is there's been a lot of previous research. Uh, back in um, 1998, Toman Cross was the first one we came across, championships increased applications. Um, McAvoy uh, football win percentages increased applications. Uh, Humphreys in 2007 discovered that uh, athletic success increased alumni giving. Uh, Pope and Pope uh, in an extensive article, looked at championship and he found that that increased the uh, SAT test scores of universities. Uh, the next two found that when teams have successful sports programs uh, and during a championship year, uh, that grades actually fall. <laughs> yeah, you spend more time watching the football team than studying. Uh, uh, actually, Kurt Rudolph, a co-author here, that's, he's the author of the 2014 study, and he looked at Clemson University. Uh, Chung, in 2013, uh, discovered that, um, that when it comes to these amenities, athletic success is more important to lower academic achieving students and higher academic achieving students. Uh, in 2016 bowl game invitations, a bowl game is a postseason after the season, it's usually on TV, increase the median test score. Uh, Kurt Rudolph and colleagues uh, just recently in 2020 uh, looked at what's known as a Cinderella, Cinderella run in the NCAA basketball tournament. It's essentially the Flutie effect of basketball and they, they showed is that uh, Enrollment increased, particularly at private universities, when the teams went further than expected. That excitement drew students to the game. And then Austin I and uh, Parker um, found that the Flutie effect existed in football. Uh, the surprising result that we found is the Flutie effect of, 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 was not just for the winners of the game. It was also for the losers of the game. We discovered that if you lost a of uh, uh, an uh, unexpected game that I guess that in this case bad publicity is not necessarily always just because you lost you you also saw interest in your program go up and applications went up um, now in terms of our research it's not the Flutie effect that matters it's the anti Flutie effect and there hasn't been a lot of studies on, on academic malfeasance. Uh, the first one we found was Smith 2015, which looked at lesser sanctions, like losing scholarships and things that if they found some sort of malfeasance. Uh, and it had no effects on uh, admissions, either basketball or football sanctions. However, uh, Austin, myself, Kurt, and others in 2019, 2020, this is what we're extending the, this research, I discovered that basketball postseason tournament bans by telling you that you had done things of malfeasance that won't allow you to go to a tournament, reduced enrollment and academic quality at the university. And then we saw, found the same thing in football, except for not the quality effects. Uh, if you were banned from a, a postseason bowl game, which like I said, is usually televised, it decreased applications and enrollment, uh, but we didn't find the quality effects. Now, in terms of this study, we got our data uh, from on Holland, Tomek, and Solander. Uh, they, they, uh, so the data that we're using is from the U.S. News and World Report peer rankings, and we wanted to know is do these same sort of postseason tournament bans affect uh, rankings as well as other measures? So. What do I mean by academic uh, malfeasance, a bowl ban? Uh, so I had uh, I found this directly from the NCAA handbook that's online. And it says NCAA enforcement of academic misconduct cases. And I'll, I'll just read it because I think it's, it really kind of sets up why a bowl ban comes about or a tournament ban. 
A former men's basketball head coach acted unethically and failed to promote the atmosphere of compliance when he directed his staff to engage in academic misconduct. During the investigation, the former head coach fabricated a document to justify payments to student athletes and took ac other actions to thwart the investigations. Uh, penalties in this case included three years of probation, a two year postseason ban, and that's what we really keyed in on is a postseason ban for the men's basketball team so they weren't able to go to the tournament. Uh, reductions in scholarships and recruiting opportunities, as well as a show cause case for a number of individuals, including the former head coach. So in terms of ours, we're looking at the most serious malfeasance, a, a malfeasance that would lead to a postseason ban, either not being able to go to a tournament or not being able to go to a bowl game uh, that are up, that are uh, televised at the end of the season. Uh, in terms of our study, we're looking at um, data between 1998 and 2018. So we have 21 years of data. And during those 21 years of data, we discovered that there were 22 tournament bans in basketball. Uh, one school had two bans in this time period, and that was the University of Southern uh, Mississippi. In football, there were fewer bowl bans. There were a total of 14 during our time period, and they occurred at 10 schools with the University of Alabama, University of Southern California, Penn State, and Ole Miss, all having two bands during that time period. Uh, in our paper, we list all of the bands. I'll just kind of um, put up a few of them. So what we discovered is we list the year of the band, um, and then what was the cause of the band? Academic fraud, is improper benefits, gambling. Uh, so what we're finding is there was both the malfeasance on the academic side, either uh, falsifying uh, student grades or courses that weren't there, or payments of, or other unethical conducts. Uh, and so these are examples of um, men's basketball band. Like I said, we list all in the paper. This is just enough that we can fit on the screen here. And then there's also football bands. Uh, football bands, um, there weren't, weren't as many, uh, but we saw that there were many different spots. Uh, now, uh, the data, like I said, what we had is data from the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, the U.S. News and World Report releases a ranking every year that helps students decide what school to go to. And one of the things that they rank is known as peer rankings. And, and I think, once again, it's worth just reading this. A peer ranking is an academic rep reputation. Mat OK, I'm sorry. It, academic race matters because of factors that cannot easily be captured elsewhere. For example, an institution known for having innovative approach of teaching may perform especially well on this indicator, whereas students who struggle to keep accreditation uh, will likely p perform poorly. Uh, so who are these people? Every year, uh, presidents, provosts, and deans of admissions rank the quality of their peer institutions, and they rank it on a five-point scale, a uh, one being a low rank, five being distinguished, one marginal, five distinguished. Um, and so the peer ranking is one of the dependent variables that we look at. Uh, it turns out that U.S. News and World Rankings are important to students. Um, we did, it, uh, McDon McDonough et al. in 1998 found that an improved ranking increased applications from higher income students that tend to be full pay. Uh, Bowman and Bastostato uh, discovered that being on the front page of the ranking increased applications at national universities. In 2014, Alter and Reback discovered that if you're listed in the top 25, they saw an increase of applications of 6 to 10 percent. Now, this was the overall ranking. Uh, in this overall ranking, the peer ranking makes up 20 percent of the total rankings. And so one of the, like I said, one of the dependent variables we look at is how does academic malfeasance, as measured by bands, influence that? And uh, so uh, now we get to our data and empirical analysis. Uh, what we are, use is just kind of simple regression where we have a dependent variable and we use uh, 
a ban and we use fixed effects at the university. There's 116 schools uh, and then there's also fixed effects by years. Um, and we also cluster the standard errors. Now I just listed one ban, but we do what we do is we have the the year of the ban itself, which is a dummy variable, the year after the ban. So we include two lag variables, both for tournament bans and football bans. So in some ways you can kind of think of this as an event study. There's an event to the ban and then does it erode over time? Uh, and here are the dependent variables that we use to try to explain. Uh, the first, first three columns are, um, are, I'm sorry, the first three rows are dealing with um, peer rankings. Uh, so what is the average peer ranking? We know that it ranges between one and five. The average ranking is 3.1. Uh, and then if we look at the change in peer rankings from one year to the next, uh, the, we see that it moves very little. Some go up, some go down, but the change in peer ranking is very small. Uh, the minimum, uh, we did see one school drop by a whole point, and the maximum one school increased by a whole point. Uh, once again, like I said, they, they go up and down, so the mean itself might not be masking the actual movement, which is why we also report the absolute value of the uh, peer rankings change. And notice it also is quite small. Uh, you get a reputation, your peer ranking doesn't change very much, just 0 0.06. Uh, but it does matter. Uh, there's research out there saying that just slight movements will affect uh, whether people move up and down in terms of, of um, applying to the college. Uh, other data that we find very useful for our research is that they also list a whole lot of things that they consider matter for school quality. Uh, one thing is the percent of alumni giving. Uh, we used, uh, actually I should say, the, the remainder of them we use both as a dependent variable to control for peer rankings and then also use them as, I'm um, sorry, independent variables to, as, to explain peer rankings and then we use them as dependent variables to see if malfeasance itself influences those. And so we have percent of alumni giving, which is uh, the percentage of alumni they give to the university. In this case, we discovered it's about 15% on every year give uh, money to the university. And then if you give to the university, how much do you give? And the average amount is $98. It ranges between one and 273. And then we have uh, something known as the acceptance rate. The acceptance rate is you take um, the number of people who apply to the college and then the people who are admitted and that is the acceptance rate. It, the argument is uh, the more selective the school, the higher quality. So a school that has 5% selectivity is a high quality school. One that has 100% selectivity is a low quality school as measured by acceptance rate. Uh, and then the next two are created, uh, the graduation retention rate and this student selection rate, both are created by the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, the graduation retention rate looks at the number of students that graduate within six years and uh, the retention rate, particularly of freshmen as well as others. And then they use weighted ad averages. A one is considered um, the best graduation, 300 the worst. So it's just like the draft. If I'm number one in the draft, I'm the top player. If I'm number 300 in the draft, I'm the lowest uh, player. And the student selectivity ratio, is a combination of being in the freshman top 10 as well as test scores. And um, it also ranges between one and three. It's a weighted average created by the US News and World Report. Uh, the next, uh, actually, <laughs> the student selection rate ratio is made up by uh, freshmen in the top 10% of their class, ACT scores, SAT scores, as well as other test scores. And then the last three um, dependent variables that we use are considered uh, quality measures at a university. Uh, the percent of classes over 50, uh, that's, the more there is, the, the lower quality of the university. Uh, percent class time sizes under 20, uh, the more there, the higher quality of the university. And then student faculty ratio, also a lower ratio suggests you have less students per teacher, you have a higher quality university as viewed by US News and World Report. So let's see what the results are.
Um, we'll start with um, uh, peer rankings. Uh, when we were dis discussing how we were going to do this, we kind of thought we'd look at two different measures. One is the peer rankings themselves, and then the change in peer rankings, where we just took the first difference between the time periods. And uh, you'll notice that there are two columns for peer rankings, one where there are no school controls, and one where uh, there are um, school controls. The school control variables are all the other dependent variables we use, the, the um, uh, alumni giving ratios, all of the additional ones. So if we look at the first column, this was a surprising result to us. We were thinking there was going to be an anti Flutie effect and that peer rankings should go down if you are identified as a uh, infracting school and, and you are banned from the university. But we find that both for a tournament band and for a bowl band, your rankings go up. Uh, now, it, the in the tournament band, uh, it falls away when you control for other measures, uh, but it doesn't fall away for a bowl band. Uh, the interesting result is it goes up the year of the band and then it falls the year after the band. Uh, uh, and then if we look at change in peer rankings, we find that the result generally holds. We, if you look at, uh, we see that there's a positive 0 0.074 uh, in the change in ranking for a bowl band. Uh, even if we control it, it's 0 0.062. It's not statistically significant, but the magnitude is about the same as the other ones. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of uh, magnitudes? So if we look at peer rankings, we know that the mean change is very small, 0 0.061. So a coefficient of 0 0.06 is a 99% increase compared to the mean absolute change in any given year. So it's a, it's a pretty big jump. Uh, and then a decrease of uh, negative 0 0.48 is a 79% decrease. So it goes up by 90, uh, 99% and then the year after it falls by 79%. And those are uh, in for football bowl bands when we use controls. Uh, if we're looking at the tournament bands um, for um, peer rankings, uh, it's a 133% increase. So instead of seeing a uh, anti-Flutie effect, we almost are seeing a Flutie effect in this case. And that surprised us. Um, however, when we start to look at other measures, we see, excuse me, um, we see um, that there is an anti-Flutie effect. In this first column, uh, actually the first two columns, what we look at is alumni giving and the amount of alumni giving. And in the last two columns are the acceptance rates and the graduation retention rates directly at the university. And let me talk about the first two columns first. Uh, when it comes to the percent of alumni giving, there doesn't seem to be much change. Uh, 1%, 1%, just none of them are statistically significant. When it comes to the amount of alumni giving, however, we discover in terms of magnitudes, tournament bands, negative 15, negative 12, negative 15.9, uh, although only one of them is uh, statistically significant because this is essentially population data, it is informative that during a band, uh, the amount people give to the university falls. And this is also true in a, uh, football bowl band, they, they drop by $9 or actually $10 when we round it up. Uh, and then the last two columns, the acceptance rate, uh, like I said, it's a measure of uh, the quality at the college. We see that during a, a bowl band that the acceptance rate goes up and the year after the bowl band, the acceptance rate goes up. Uh, this happens to be consistent with previous work that Kurt, me and Austin had done. Uh, on enrollment at the university is showing that bowl bands do influ influence applications, acceptance, and um, enrollment. 
Uh, when we look now, the surprising result is when we look at graduation retention rate, um, the year after a bowl ban and the second year after the bowl ban, there is a, um, a decrease in ranking, a decrease in ranking. But if you remember a decrease in ranking, are, you're moving up. So in other words, there's a six point movement up. So we're seeing greater retention and greater uh, graduations during that time period. And in some ways, uh, that's consistent with Kurt's study that showed that for a successful team, uh, students' grades go down. Well, when students' grades go down, they're less likely to, to graduate. They're also less likely to stay at the university. And so that's consistent with that as well. Um, I guess I, I said that already, but I, I, I spelled this out. Uh, there is no economically significant changes in alumni giving. Uh, but if we put it in percentage terms, uh, the average giving is about $100 a year. So we see a 16% or a 10% decrease. Uh, universities become less selective. The average acceptance rate is 64%. So we see a 6% or 4.5% less on average. Um, and then, like we said, the US News graduation retention rank uh, goes up by 6.1. 6 uh, so we actually see that there is greater retention and a greater graduation during a bowl ban. Now let's look at uh, student quality. Student quality, um, let's see. Uh, we have ACT scores at the 75% level, ACT scores at the 25th percentile. Um, the 75th percentile is the top scores. The 25th percentile is, say, there's what? It's the uh, lower quarter of the class. And then uh, freshman top 10% and uh, student selectivity rank is a combination of the three. And if we look at it, once again, we're finding a negative anti Flutie effect. A tournament bans lowers the, the score uh, by 0.612. It lowers the score of the 25th percentile student by 0.736. Uh, and it, it actually lowers it by 0.375 the year after the tournament ban and also lowers it by 0.05 two years after the ban. Uh, surprisingly, we did see for the 25th percentile student an increase of uh, these lower uh, lower tiered students with their um, ACT score when there was a football ban. Uh, if we look at the aggregation of the two, I'm sorry, let's, let's skip over that one. I should have probably put that last. Uh, the freshman top 10%, we see that there's a decrease in the percentage of students that come from the top 10 the year after the tournament ban. I'm sorry, the year of the tournament ban and the year after the tournament ban. And when we look at the rankings, we see a seven point increase in the during the tournament ban and a 4% during the selectivity ban. And if you recall, once again, a movement up says that lower quality students are attending the university. Uh, so what do we terms in terms of magnitudes? A tournament ban that lowers test scores of the 75th percentile students by negative 0.612 evaluated at the mean test score of 27 is moving from the 85th percentile of all test takers to 82nd percentile of all test takers. A tournament ban that lowers the test scores of the 25th percentile student uh, of negative 0.6 evaluated at a mean of 22. A decrease of one unit goes from the 64th percentile to the 58th percentile. So we see that both the top tier students have a lower test score and the lower tier students have a lower test score. So overall tests, uh, overall quality had fallen at the university. Now it's not the same for a, a bowl ban. Bowl ban actually increases the test scores of the lower tiered students, the 25th percentile student. Um, further academic effects. Uh, a tournament ban lowers the amount of top academic performing students by 3.8%. Uh, the year of the ban and 2.5% the year after the ban, where the the uh, this the average was um, being the top 10% of the classes at 
38.5%. So this is a 10% uh, fewer students and 6.5% fewer students of those students in that category. And then if we look at the U.S. News and Selectivity rate falls by 7.2% and 4.3%. Uh, we see that that's a scale on one being the highest to so seven point seven point increase says it's a lower quality students going to the university in the aggregate. Uh, now the last one we look at um, class the, the university class size percentages. Uh, the percent of classes over fifty, the percent of classes under twenty, and the faculty uh, student faculty ratio. When it comes to basketball bands, we see that there's really nothing going on. Uh, but we do see that during a uh, bowl ban, a football bowl ban, uh, we see a decrease in uh, the number of classes over 50. Uh, and we also see the exact same thing as a decrease in the faculty student ratio. Now, really what that's saying in terms of the U.S. News and World Report is these schools are becoming higher quality because there are fewer classes that are over 50. There's a lower student faculty ratio. Uh, we contend it's probably <laughs> the result that, that, that during a bowl ban, there's less students that are going to the university. We don't have a measure of enrollment, but this kind of captures that enrollment might actually be falling at the university, lowering the student faculty ratio and lowering the number of students in a 50-person uh, class. One thing we don't see is uh, any changes in the percent of students under 20 students. Uh, football bowl bands lowered the percentage of large classes over 50 by 1.5. Uh, the average student class is 12. Point, so, so we see a 12% reduction in class sizes. Uh, football bowl bands lower student ratios by 0.8. The average student ratio is 17 students per faculty, so we see a 5% reduction. Uh, so, so both of them are <clears throat> relatively important in terms of magnitude. Uh, and that finishes up the regression. Uh, I guess I'm a little early, but never know how long these things take. Uh, overall anti flu the effect conclusion. One thing we find is when it comes to the stakeholders that are not closely tied to the college, uh, there's mixed effects. We see that peer rankings seem to go up. Kind of leads to the idea that no publicity is bad publicity. Um, but people closer to the university, uh, it seems that there is an anti fluity effect. Athletic malfeasance is measured by NCA post bans influence in student, student enrollment rate. It also lowers the amount of alumni giving, and it also lowers the quality of students that come to the university. Uh, now, this is consistent with uh, Chung, who found that um, students that don't, well, actually it's not, yeah, never mind. That doesn't matter. Chung was like, saying athletics doesn't matter at all. Uh, this says that athletics does seem to affect higher, higher quality students more, they decide not to attend the university. And so our overall conclusion is that college athletics are indeed a front porch of the university and lead to um, an anti fluty effect when they are caught cheating. And that's my presentation. Let me go ahead and unshare. Thank you very much, Peter. Peter. How do I unshare? <laughs> uh, there should be there a, should be a button. button top right. Top right. The one, the same one to share. share. I've got a slight oh, echo. I've got that's that's more more. iPad. iPad. So, so. Oh, there it is. Okay, I will. Did I unshare? You did. You did. Yep. yep. So I've got so a bit of an echo. I don't know if that's because you've got your iPad on as well, Peter. No, I don't have my iPod in now. Just got an echo for some reason. Seems to have gone. That's fine. But anyway, thank you. Uh, what, what I was going to say as I um, as I open up the floor to discussion was um, you mentioned Reading uh, generously uh, in your introduction. Reading isn't the most um, glamorous of parts of the UK. I say that with Rob Simmons with his camera on. Rob knows Reading well uh, as well. Um, but nonetheless, we, 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 what you're talking about is quite interesting because we've been looking a little bit at uh, university. Um, 
kind of data in relation to the local football club. So obviously Reading University isn't linked to Reading Football Club, but Reading Football Club this season has been on the brink of promotion to the Premier League. And we're told anecdotally that when Reading Football Club was in the Premier League a few years ago, the university did have a bit of a boom in terms of applications to the university. And this is, I mean, there are, there are different universities and different football club relationships, but Reading is a fairly you know, generic, small city, large town with one university, one football club. Uh, and so people, like Daniel Weimar in Germany has looked at the impact of uh, I think Bundesliga success uh, on local universities there as well. Um, in terms of the chat, there isn't much in the chat. Uh, it's, uh, Brad asked about the uh, some of your references that you referred to, some of your own papers. Uh, and so the reality is, there's uh, it's it's a good time to open the floor to questions. So if anyone has a question they want to ask, please do raise your hand. And Rob's jumped straight in, so go ahead, Rob. You on mute. There we go. Uh, thanks, Peter. That's very interesting. Obviously, it's a different world to uh, UK. This uh, emphasis on athletics and um, uh, the association of athletics with the uh, with the college. So, uh, I'm wondering if you could give us a bit more on the mechanism linking the malfeasance to the student responses. There, uh, I mean, are the students really sort of looking at these episodes following the fortunes of the football team or whatever uh, or, or is it is this more of a proxy for something else is, is what i'm wondering we've actually looked at it in two sorts of ways uh, one is it might be indeed a signal the idea is i don't know the quality of the university and because i don't know the quality of the university if if they're allowing their football team to go crazy or their basketball team to go crazy it's a signal of overall quality and because it's so visible we might use that so yeah um we that's a yeah i we're not really sure i mean the, it, the mechanism could be that um it's an amenity I, I have a nephew i'll pick on him for a second he told me he chose michigan state because they had a good football team and a good basketball team well <laughs> if you are losing you might decide, well, I don't want to go there if that's an important amenity to you. So I, I don't know. I, I, I tend to lean more towards the signal end, uh, but it's hard. I, there's no way I can differentiate between the two. Right. Uh, another question I had was on the again on the student response. Uh, do you think this would affect particular subject areas or is it across the board? Yeah, we have no way to, to tease that out. I'm not really sure what it would do. Uh, now, we did find in an earlier paper there was no gender difference. It affected male, male students and female students the same way. I think that was in our sports econ paper because uh, we had male admissions rate, female admissions. So there was no difference there, uh, if I remember correctly. Well, I guess one thing you could do is check whether the uh, college has a medical school or not. Mm hmm. I think the majority, well, no, no, that's not true. Probably the, 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 seems like it was the biggest schools that were sanctioned. And a lot of the bigger schools do have med schools. But yet we were trying to decide if we should do private schools and public schools. And there just wasn't enough malfeasance to separate the two. I mean, there's just so many. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Any more questions and comments? I guess one thing is, of course, the if you, if you know, going back, I was mentioning the the UK example of, of football clubs and universities. The two are are totally separate from each other, and so it's purely a a gain for us at the University of Reading if Reading Football Club gains promotion because we didn't have any say in it. You know, it wasn't whether we were better run or worse run. Uh, the football club and the university are very distinct things. And so it's much more of an exogenous variation than I guess potentially um, folk yeah. might wonder about in the case yeah, of universities and college teams. Yeah, it's a good way to kind of get at this. Because if we see an increase at Reading because of the success of that club, then you know clearly that it's an amenity. 
that it's a consumption amenity <laughs> and not a signal for university quality. So yeah, that's an interesting study. <laughs> Johan's got his hand up. Hi, Peter, thank you for that. I was just wondering, can you disaggregate between students in within state and outside the state? Because you talked about the signal and effect. No, um, no. Okay, okay, forget that then. Yeah, you get the data you have. Uh, I, yeah, I, well, if you recall, one of the earlier studies found that high income students and low income students, we had none of that ability either. Uh, I don't, it would be very interesting to see if you could do that with in state and out of state students, but we did not, do not have access to that data. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Had more questions and comments? Kurt, do you have anything that I missed? You did great, Pete. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> it's hard. I do wish we had. I wish we had the you, you don't see people, so you have no idea how it's going across. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, did, yeah. you did great. I wish we had in-state and out-of-state. I think we uh, we capitalized on the data that we had, and and you're right. I mean, is it is it a proxy for? Is it a proxy for the school, right? If the athletic department gets caught with malfeasance, right? They're they're doing bad things. Is that a proxy for a school that allows bad things to occur, or is it really just a, an amenity feature? Um, I think a lot of our arguments have been because it's so hard to to understand how the management of the university is run, whether it's run well or not. That if they're running the athletic department well, maybe they run the whole school well. Or if the athletic department is is dirty, like with these malfeasance then maybe the whole school does dirty things and is not, has malfeasance and and maybe it's a proxy but i i thought the most interesting thing was that um it increased some of the lower quality students to the sense where you think that those are the ones that are just going for for the amenity <laughs> features and and care less about the academics um, which kind of falls in line with the general theory although you can't separate those two out Thanks, Kurt. One technical question was you presented school controls in your first table, but then you didn't after that. Did the school controls make much of a difference in your other questions? I didn't know if we could include them. Because huh? <laughs> <there, laughs> uh, the reason we initially included them is because the original paper uh, that used peers had done them. Mm. And, and, and when I was thinking about it as an econometrician, okay, well, I can understand how uh, the peer effects might affect that I wasn't sure if I should include class, you know, in, in enrollment rate on il alumni giving. So I, I wasn't sure. I, I guess it's worth doing to see if it's robust. I have to be, be honest, I haven't done that yet. So I, I should go back and do that and see if it changes when I got to make sure I don't include. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, that's worth doing. I'll do that. Okay, any more questions, comments? Well, it seems you managed to uh, cover all questions and uh, give us a really interesting talk, uh, Peter. I know it's so. different, than, different than most, particularly from a European perspective, because it's so foreign. <laughs> well, the nice thing with this, um, you know, with this series is that we get a lot of you know, the European talks and the North American talks. We've had a good mix of um, stuff to do with college sports and um, you know the professional sports in the States as well as over here. So it's been quite, it's been an education for me the whole time. Uh, and, you know, I agree with what you were saying at the start, Peter. It's been quite a, a highlight every week uh, for me, uh, you know, having some nice research to listen to at the end of each week uh, during this, during the, during the pandemic. So thank you again for providing something really interesting for us. Yes, the last thing I'll say is I, if, if you the following of the Supreme Court decision, I think will be really interesting to see what they actually do, because there is such a cartel aspect. I, <laughs> I feel for a lot of the students who, who, you know, they can't even sell their own likeness <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Yeah, I guess that has the potential to shake up quite a bit the system, I presume. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I mean, if if a coach is walking away with 8.9 million and students, <laughs> it, it just kind of points to why malfeasance occurs. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll wrap up the recording. Uh, and all, all I'll say as I wrap up the recording is that we uh, we return next week. Next week, we have a North American-based economist, Stefan Szymanski, uh, and he's going to be presenting, though, on English football uh, and the effect of new stadiums on attendance patterns. Uh, so do join us uh, again next week. Uh, thank you uh, for those of us that were here. Thank you uh, to um, Peter for the talk uh, and his co-authors. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, James.